100 watts of passive cooling. That pretty much sums up what you're looking at right now. And it's appropriately named The Beast from a company called Monster Labo. And despite being a fairly small brand, they have some pretty big ambitions here. You see, with completely passive cooling, and I mean completely passive, no fans at all, there has always been this compromise when it comes to component choice. Like sure, you can have this completely silent zero fan PC that you've always dreamed about, but when it comes to the components, you really have to dial things back quite a bit. This PC, on the other hand, is completely different. Here we have an overclock 10900K and an RTX 3080. And yeah, this is one of the most interesting PCs that I've ever built. Of course, to accommodate that much passive cooling, the beast is pretty big, just slightly larger than your average mid tower case, but over half of that volume is pure heatsink. The heatsink fins are spaced out quite a bit and so are optimized for completely passive operation, allowing all of that hot, less dense and slow moving air to make its way up through the fin stack. There are also two 140mm fan slots up top though if you do want to run the beast in what you can think of as an assisted airflow mode and although the purely passive performance mode here is really really impressive, a couple of fans at around 700 RPM can make a decent impact. I'll also note that there are two independent heat sinks here, one for the GPU and the other for the CPU with mounting positioned on opposite sides. The interior layout is also completely unconventional compared to your standard mid tower which makes the beast really refreshing to work in. Also, big thumbs up for that super clean logo on the front. So let's jump in and see what components I used for this build. For the power supply, I went with Silverstone's Nightjar NJ700. It's a completely passive 700 watt 80 plus titanium rated unit, which is really a perfect fit for what we're building here. Super powerful, super efficient, and also completely silent. This will also be the first component that you'll want to install into the build. Pretty straightforward, it just bolts in vertically right at the bottom, and you can face the power supply whichever way you prefer. For the CPU, I've gone with the Intel 10900K, more so as a bit of a challenge to see what the beast can really handle, as this chip can quite easily exceed 200 watts by itself. Now, of course, a Ryzen 5900X or 5950X would be the most sensible choice, of course, with power draw typically at around the 140 watt mark at full load, but in either scenario, there are new CPUs from both Intel and AMD around the corner, so the choice today probably isn't that important. Now, one thing that's really important here when it comes to the motherboard choice is opting for something with a borderline overkill or just a really overspec VRM. If you can get something with a decent heatsink on it and just a ton of power stages, that is really a good idea because we have no active airflow in this build whatsoever. The one that we're going with here, for example, example is the Asus Maximus 12 Hero and this thing has 16 power stages rated for 90 amps each so honestly in this scenario running this VRM completely passive won't be an issue. Now installing the motherboard is probably the trickiest part of the entire build process. First you need to install the mounting bracket onto the heatsink for whatever socket you're going with and I will note that the included spaces don't really do anything. Either way it's a pretty simple and straightforward process. Next though is really really fiddly. Basically you need to plug in a bunch of stuff into the motherboard before installing it. The front I.O., the 8-pin CPU cable, the 24-pin motherboard cable, and the included PCIe 4.0 riser cable. The easiest way to do this is like shown, with the bottom of the board facing the front of the case, and of course with the entire build laying flat on its side. Here comes the real tricky part though. You need to line up the motherboard with the mounting hardware that you just installed, while at the same time making sure that the cables are not getting jammed or blocked on the other side. Might take you about five minutes to get right but it is totally doable in the end. Then just tighten it all up with the included springs and thumb screws, plug in the power supply cables and that's the hardest part over. So yeah, no motherboard tray or anything like that in your usual build. The motherboard here is literally just attached by the heatsink, but surprisingly it's held in there pretty well. And lastly we have the GPU. Here we're going with the RTX 3080 Trinity from Zotac, which is one of the few supported models on their compatibility list. And despite being a fairly long cooler design, the PCB is actually pretty compact, which does help us out a little bit when it comes to installation. This is also a really straightforward card when it comes to the teardown process. Just a small Phillips head screwdriver and a bunch of screws. Nothing tricky, just a really average teardown. The first part of GPU installation is installing the heat spreader for our memory and VRM. These components can get seriously hot if not cooled correctly, so I would definitely recommend going with the spreader option as opposed to just sticking on your own heat sinks or even worse, leaving that portion of the PCB completely bare. The included spreader is from EK and is 
is made pretty well. So we need to mount this to the GPU heatsink while including some thermal paste in between to allow for some decent heat transfer. Then it's as simple as mounting on our RTX 3080 just as if you were bolting on a water block. And then lastly comes the backplate. All in all though, the finished build looks pretty epic. The completely closed look of the build is something that I'm a huge fan of and the tempered glass works really well to keep things looking clean and understated. At the same time, you can still see a bit of what's happening on the inside, most notably the really unconventional hardware layout, which is probably one of the most interesting things of this build. For now though, let's get to performance. And with a 10900K and an RTX 3080 in there, it's clear that some tuning and undervolting is necessary. So let's start with the CPU. Monster Labo claims that the CPU heatsink is rated for 150 watts of cooling in a completely passive state. And after some tinkering, our 10900K seemed good for a sustained 4.5 gigahertz at 1.13 volts across all 10 cores. That's really not bad at all, considering that's still a decent overclock compared to an actual default spec stock 10900K performance, which at 125 watts typically sits at around 4.1 to 4.2. As for the GPU, well, that took a lot more tinkering to get things right, but you can still get an RTX 3080 in here running completely passive, no fans at all, and holding clock speeds nice and steady. But again, you do have to kind of tune things and play around with it. We'll get to that in a second, but first it's important to understand how the airflow works in this case. So, you know, relying purely on natural convection, there isn't actually any cooling or airflow in the Monster Labo Beast until things actually start heating up. At that point, the air becomes hotter, less dense, and so now being lighter, rises upwards through the heatsink and starts cooling it. And it's honestly really mind-blowing to feel the speed of which the air is moving through and upwards out of the case without a single fan. Definitely not something that I've seen before in any other PC build. The GPU heatsink in the Beast is rated for 250 watts of passive cooling, which is really insane, but still that's not enough for our 320 watt RTX 3080, at least at stock. So after a bit of tinkering, this is the profile that worked for me in MSI Afterburner. I set the voltage and frequency curve to 1710 megahertz at 743 millivolts, which is a pretty hefty undervolt. And I also locked the power limit to 70% to prevent the card pulling beyond that. Because another thing that ends up happening in this build is a power leakage scenario where the GPU exceeds 80 degrees C. And because it's getting hotter, it leaks more power to perform the same task. So that power limit cap is really useful to prevent the GPU from doing that, and instead it'll just pull about 30 to 50 megahertz less from time to time. But yeah, in the end, with this tuning profile, I was able to get the 3080 running completely passive, sitting at about 1700 megahertz, and not budging from that after an hour of consistent use. There was no air conditioning in the room, no fans, no windows open, just pure natural convection doing its thing. In the end, that's about 150 to 200 megahertz less than what you'd expect from an actively called RTX 3080, but the difference here is that we are 100% silent. What I would recommend though, if you are going with an RTX 3080 or higher, and especially if you're going with like an RTX 3080 Ti or a 3090, is by adding just a couple of 140mm fans at the top of the case and running those as exhaust. Sure, it's not going to be completely silent anymore, but you know, even spinning these at like 600, 700 RPM, you can make quite a bit of a difference in GPU temperatures and the amount of performance that you can sustain. It doesn't really make sense to spin these fans faster than that. After all, the heatsink design is optimized for slower moving air, but even with these, we can reclaim back about 150 megahertz. The profile that worked here was setting the GPU clock to 1875 megahertz, the voltage to about 870 millivolts, and the power limit at 90%. Again, without that power limit in force, we do run into a scenario where the GPU will just start using more power despite being undervolted, simply because it's getting hotter. Some of the time, that meant even tipping over 300 watts, despite normally operating at about 260 watts with this frequency and voltage at normal temperatures. So yeah, we're still losing a bit of performance here, maybe 50 to 100 megahertz at most compared to stock, but for virtually silent operation, it is really hard to complain. As for the CPU performance with that fan up top, well, our CPU temps drop about 10 degrees compared to before, which is a slight improvement, giving you about 100 to 200 megahertz of extra 
extra headroom if you do want to bump things up a bit, with total CPU power sitting at around 190 watts. Monster Labo claim up to 250 watts of CPU load can be sustained in the fan assisted mode, but that's likely with better fans with what we're working with here. In the end though, here's how the build sounded with and without those fans installed. And the last thing I'll mention here is the electrical noise, which for a completely passive fanless build, that is a really important topic of discussion, but also a bit of a subjective one. So when it comes to the GPU coil whine, which is usually a big problem, here it really wasn't. I mean, I barely noticed it at all in this build, and that's with a 3080. Sure, the undervolt here does help things quite a bit, but I think the electrical design of the 3080 Trinity from Zotac just seems to be pretty good. What was noticeable, for me anyway, was the high-pitched noise coming from the power supply. This is something that was really obvious to me, although I did get used to it over time. My partner, on the other hand, she could not hear it at all. PC on, PC off, she really couldn't tell the difference. It all sounded completely the same to her. According to Linus Tech Tips and their team, they seem to have pretty much the same experience as my partner. They couldn't really hear anything, so it's clear that this will differ from person to person. Just note though that if you are sensitive to high frequencies, especially if you are a little bit younger and you have really good ears, it's just something extra to consider. Overall though, what this build can do is seriously impressive. 400 watts of passive cooling is right around what I was getting on this thing, and if you do require or just really badly want a truly silent high performance system, there actually is no other option. The Beast is by far the highest performance, lowest compromise passively cooled system that exists today. They do have a Kickstarter campaign coming up in a few days if you are interested, and there are plenty of customer bought builds out there from previous pre-orders if you want to check those out as well. And honestly, the pricing isn't even that offensive. At around 900 to 1000 US dollars, just looking at their previous campaigns, you really are getting quite a lot for that kind of money. The entire case, all of the heat sinks, the spreaders, all of the accessories, and when you consider what kind of money you would have to spend on like water cooling hardware to get close to these kind of noise levels, I honestly think it would be quite comparable. So so I will leave this one linked down below. As always, a huge thanks for watching and I will see you all in the next one.